Hi everybody, Patrick here from EngineeringShock.com, ElectronicLessons.com, and PaintballProps.com. This is my wireless power transfer DIY electronics kit. Uh, I'm going to now show you in a minute show you how to put it together uh, using step-by-step -step soldering instructions, where to put components, how to test it, etc. We got our transmitter, our receiver, our booster, and our LED bank. Uh, I will be selling variations of this set, which will include only the transmitter and the receiver, or the transmitter receiver kit, the switch, the booster, and an LED bank. Um, the LED bank is just an example of what you can do and power with uh, the transmitter and the receiver. And the booster is also a very nice tool to use here because it can boost the output voltage to a very useful and solid voltage. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm, I've actually posted the introduction to video uh, below and uh, at the end of this video we'll give a demonstration but if you want a quick demonstration just click, uh, click on the link below. Now let's put these together. As you can see I've got the transmitter parts and the receiver parts so I'm going to go through them separately. First of all we have a 24 micro henry coil, a custom PCB, 5 millimeter power jack, four 3 pin headers, a 0.1 microfarad uh, ceramic capacitor rated for 100 volts, uh, a heat sink, an IRF uh, 150 or 540 rather, it's a FET, a uh, 33k ohm resistor, a 13k ohm resistor, a uh, diode 1N4148, 8 uh, pin dip socket, 555 timer, a 200 picofarad ceramic capacitor, a 100, uh, sorry, a 10 nanofarad ceramic capacitor, two 0 0.1 microfarad ceramic capacitors, two 100 microfarad electrolytic capacitors, a two pin terminal block for power, an alternate source of power aside from the five millimeter jack, four two pin headers, six two pin header jumpers, and that's it for the transmitter. I will be offering the schematic to those who purchase this kit as well. As for the receiver, custom PCB, another 24 micro henry uh, coil, two 0 0.1 microfarad ceramic capacitors, a 3 pin terminal block, um, two 100 microfarad electrolytic capacitors, a 2 pin header jumper, a, a red LED, a 470 ohm resistor, and a 1N4004 diode. So first of all what we're going to do is we're going to put together the transmitter. Now the transmitter requires uh, more patience and more time than the receiver but we're going to go through it piece by piece so that you can follow along at your end. So here are our transmitter parts. We're going to do our resistors and our ceramic capacitors first. Now uh, you want to make sure you pay close attention to this because if you get your resistors mixed up you're going to burn out your FET. This is very important. So RB, right here, the slot labeled RB, is where you want to place your 13K ohm resistor. The RA slot right below it is where you want to place your 33K ohm resistor. Now if you can't read resistor color code, make sure you have a multimeter uh, to measure them to ensure that you don't mix up those two resistors. Again, it's going to be bad news. Now we've got <coughs> five ceramic capacitors here but we're only we're going to do this ceramic capacitor on our last step we've got our two zero, uh, our two 0 0.1 microfarad uh, ceramic capacitors they are labeled uh, 104 and they are to go in the C6 slot labeled 0.1U for 0 0.1 micro and the C4 slot labeled C4 0.1U now the um, 10 nanofarad capacitors labeled 103 and that goes into the C7 slot right up here labeled C7 10N for 10 nano and the 200 uh, picofarad capacitor is labeled 201 and that goes into the C1 slot right here labeled 200P for 200 pico. So solder those into place. As you can see, the leads are of equal length, so there's no polarity. You just have to make sure that you put the right capacitors in the right spot. Now, these two capacitors, the 0 0.1 microfarad uh, capacitors, they're of lesser consequence. You still want them, but they're of lesser consequence. You have to make sure that you place the 10N and the uh, 200 pico 
in the correct spots or else your circuit again is not going to work right and you could burn out your FET. So you have to make sure that you put them in the right spots. We'll get to this capacitor at the end of this of the transmitter portion of this video. So solder everything into place and next we will do our pin headers and our electrolytic capacitors. As for the two pin headers, you're going to want to solder one in here, 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 and here. For the three pin headers, you're actually only going to need three of them, but I'm going to ship a fourth just in case you need an extra. Solder one here, here, and here. Now what I like to do is, uh, if you have uh, nails, nice long nails, it's much easier to do this. I like to solder in from the top. Uh, obviously, what you're going to need to do is use your fingernail to hold it down and keep it at 90 degrees. So then from the bottom of the board, solder one lead, all while holding it into place with your fingertip. And then once the solder cools, turn the board around and solder the other lead. And, uh, and if the first solder joint that you uh, made while you were holding uh, the header down with your finger. If that needs a correction, wait until the second lead uh, cools and then correct it. It's very easy to do, uh, but be careful not to burn yourself. Now we're going to talk about this in a minute. This is the prototyping area and y there's no real function for it on this, but it's just a prototyping area with a 5 volt and ground line that you can use. Again, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, once you're done soldering those into place, don't worry about the two pin header jumpers. We're going to uh, place those at the end of this video. Next we are going to solder in our socket, our terminal block, and our diode. There are two components that I forgot to mention. One is important, one is not at all. Uh, it has an optional function. I'll get to those in the uh, in the following steps. The terminal block is easy. The terminal block has a terminal side and a plastic side. Take your terminal block with the terminals facing outwards and place it in the terminal block slot. If you solder this in backwards, you're never going to be able to wire in uh, extra power supply, uh, any extra power supply. Now this power supply is, is uh, it's, it's optional. The uh, 12 volt adapter that comes with this unit will have, um, will be able to plug in directly to the 5 millimeter jack, which we'll do uh, in the next step. Uh, okay, so anyway, saw your terminal block in, make sure you have nice healthy um, beads of solder on each of the leads and now we're going to do our socket now it might be difficult for you to see from this perspective but one side of the socket has a notch at, at one end the other side is completely flat on the board labeled NE555 this is the where the socket is to be soldered now um, there's a little notch on the bottom side from this perspective. So I'm going to take this, the side with the notch and I'm going to line it up with the notch on the board. And uh, once you have it in, use one finger to hold it down and solder it in from the bottom. Now if you solder that in backwards, then you might have, you, you, you might end up putting the 555 in backwards. We're going to get to the putting the 555 timer chip in in just a minute. Um, as for the diode, uh, what we're going to do is, you might not be able to see it from here again, but uh, on the diode, it's very, very small. There's an orange side, and there's a side with a little black stripe. The side with the little black stripe is the negative, or um, cathode. And the orange side is your positive side, or anode. And you're going to place it in the D1 slot. Now you'll notice on the top pin of the D1 slot, there's a little stripe. That's an indicator of the black side of the LED, the cathode. So you want to make sure that the black side of the diode is facing up, and the orange side is facing the bottom. If you turn this around, your oscillator circuit will not work. So I'm solder those all into place. Next, we will fit our uh, chip into the socket, and we will solder our electrolytic capacitors. And from there, we're almost done. Okay, as for the chip, on the left-hand side of the chip, you'll notice there's a notch. And from this perspective, the notch that we soldered our socket is face on our solder socket is facing left. What you want to do is gently place the bottom leads in first with the notch facing left, Squeeze gently the top leads, and it should pop right into place. Easy, huh? So, as for the electrolytics, there are two slots for the electrolytics go, C3 and C5. Now, in the case of both of these capacitors, there's a tiny, tiny, tiny little positive symbol over one of the leads. In, the, in this case, C3, from this perspective, that positive symbol, plus sign, is on the left, not the right, the left, and in the case of C6, uh, it is facing the top, not the bottom. 
So look very, very carefully for those uh, plus signs, positive signs. And uh, you'll notice that on the electrolytics, that there's a short lead and a long lead. Long lead is positive, short lead is negative. So if in the case of C3, you're going to want to place your long lead in the left hole and your short lead in the, in the right hole. In the case of C5, you're going to want to place your long lead in the top hole and your short lead in the bottom hole. Now, if you solder those in backwards and you power it up, they'll likely blow up. So be very, very careful when you solder these into place. The DC jack has three pins on it. It fits in the slot labeled DC jack. It literally only fits in one way. You're going to want to hold that down, and you don't want to apply a ton of heat at once. Apply a little bit of solder to every lead, holding it down, and then do some correction soldering, making sure that um, you know that there's a, a fair amount of solder in each hole, but you don't want to over solder it because this is a plastic based component and uh, you can melt it. So take care when solder that into, soldering that into place. So take care of all of this and next we're going to solder in our uh, 100 volt 0 0.1 microfarad uh, capacitor. We're also going to talk about the components that I missed. The two components that I forgot to mention are the 7805, 7805 5 volt regulator and the screw to connect the IRF 540 to the, to the uh, heat sink. Now what I've done is I've taken the screw and I've mounted the uh, IRF 540 to the heat sink and I've made sure that that is very, very tight, that screw. Now what this is going to do is the IRF 540 will likely get quite hot, especially if you're sucking a lot of power from the on the receiving end. So this acts to dissipate that heat and help from uh, help the IRF 540 from burning. Now what you're going to want to do there is, pardon me reaching around here, is you're going to want to make sure that the IRF, the front of the IRF is facing the right and that the screw is facing the back and you're going to want to solder this solder that into place. Now what you'll notice when you get the kit is that there is a tiny lead here and there's going to be a little bit of electrical tape over it, and that's just to ensure that the heat sink is not shorting to that specific line. That's no big deal, it's just a little bit of extra precaution. What you can do if you're even worried about that is solder it about two millimeters off the top of the board. Make sure it's nice and straight and next what we're going to want to do once that's soldered into place you're going to want to take your big capacitor, it's not polarized, there's no polarity, and you'll notice in the back there's a, uh, a slot that says 0.1U slash 100 volts. There's a little tiny capacitor slot right there. I'm going to remove this for the time being. Now you want to make sure you place this after the fact. Now you don't have to solder it into that slot. Obviously it's a big capacitor. What you can do is use these two slots. They are to the exact same lines and the uh, it's actually uh, better to solder to these two test points, uh, or the test point and ground. You don't have to. Those were originally meant as test points. I meant to use a different uh, capacitor when I was designing the board, but this is a necessary component. So test point five isn't an important test point. So make sure that after you've soldered in your FET, that you place this in. It can go in, you know, it doesn't have to go in very far. Um, and the leads are easy to solder on the bottom of the board. Very easy component to solder. Lastly, the 7805, that goes in the 7805 slot. There's a front with writing on it, and make sure, again, before you do any of the soldering, that you, you, uh, you're, you're soldering the right components in the right spot, because the IRF540 and the 7805 look identical. You have to read the writing on the front. Anyhow, there's a front, there's a back. Solder the front facing the terminal block. Solder into place, cut the leads, make sure there's no shorts. Now from here, double check all your soldering, double check that there are no shorts on the bottom of the board because uh, after this we're just about ready to test. Now there's a few different ways to test this. Uh, the best way to test this is with a scope, an oscilloscope, but you don't need one. You do need to have the receiver assembled, which we'll get to next. To, if you don't have an oscilloscope, you need a receiver to ensure that everything is hunky-dory. However, we can check to make sure that everything else is working uh, by just using a multimeter. And again, you don't need to do this, you can do this. But next, after we've soldered that all into place, we're going to place our, our uh, two-pin headers. We're just about to test, but there's another thing that I neglected to mention, and I'm sorry for the disorganization of this. Uh, I ha have uh, other versions of this that I was using for my uh, own testing, let's say right here, and uh, I neglected to 
talk about this area. Now, I developed this board specifically so that I could customize. And so I'm selling this kit kind of as a standard, whereas I designed it for myself initially. What we need to do is solder two three pin headers here, and I'll of course add those to the components list, uh, and I will be adding two more of these jumpers. So solder these two, the two extra headers to these two slots, and then we're going to place two jumpers, and then we're going to be ready to test. Alright, from the back of the board, I've t placed the two jumpers to the right, middle and right pins. Uh, they're labeled, the headers are labeled uh, pot slash res, pot slash res, and that means we're choosing between these two pots that aren't going to be populated, and the resistors, uh, the 13 and 33 k ohm resistors. Before we uh, connect the coil, we're probably going to want to run some tests. Now, uh, let's connect some jumpers. First of all, there is a two pin header here labeled 5VEN. So that enables your uh, 7805-5 volt regulator. That applies power to the input. So that takes the power from the power supply and applies it to the uh, 5 volt regulator. So now the 5 volt regulator is fed, fed power. We now have a 5 volt option on our device. Do we want to turn on our oscillator? Yes, we do. There is a 3 pin header here. To the left and middle pins, if you connect those, it's on. Middle and right is off. So we're going to take a 2 pin header. Connect the left two pins. The rightmost pin will be exposed. For the proto box, do we want five volts on the on the V plus line? This whole top rail is either five volts or V plus. V plus is your input power. We're going to select five volts just for a quick test. So on the middle and left is five volts. Middle and right is V plus. So we're going to connect the middle and left. And. For right now, lastly, we're going to take a jumper, and on the right side of the board, I have to switch places here, we've got a three pin header labeled int slash ext. Int means internal, internal oscillator, external means we're going to use an external signal to drive our FET, which will drive our coil. Now, for those of you who are a bit more adventurous and have a desktop supply as opposed to a plug-in supply, you will be provided the schematics so that you can potentially use this board to experiment with your own values and tinker around with it. But I wouldn't suggest using an external signal unless you have a benchtop supply. Um, so I'm going to take the bottom two pins, the middle and bottom pin, and I'm going to short it. Now our internal oscillator is driving our FET. Now right now our FET isn't driving anything because the coil isn't connected. But the coil will be connected soon. Uh, and we might as well just get this out of the way and take two 2-pin uh, two headers and short the coil rails. Sorry about that. And we're left with one extra for now. So now what we're going to do is we're going to power it up. We're going to take the black probe of... We're going to set our multimeter to voltage, connect the negative uh, to the ground rail, which is on the bottom, and our positive, our red probe to the 5 volt line, and we should read 5 volts. So I'm going to stop it, set up my uh, set up the experiment, and we're going to test that. So now I'm going to plug this in. And sorry if there's a little bit of glare. Negative to, I've got it set up for voltage measurements. Got my negative to the ground line and positive to any of the top pins here. 4.985 volts, so 5 volts. It works fine. There's no shorts, everything's hunky-dory. Now we're going to solder our coil and we're going to stop testing this. We're going to go on to building our receiver. Soldering the coil is easy. There's no polarity and the ends are uh, already tinned. So basically there are two holes here, here labeled coil 1, coil 2 and just soldered into place. And so what's soldered into place? It should be standing straight up like this. On to the receiver. Much simpler. We're going to breeze through this. If you've been watching so far, uh, these components are all similar. We've got a resistor, no polarity. We've got two ceramic capacitors, uh, 0 0.1 microfarad, no po polarity. Two electrolytics with a polarity. Remember, long lead is positive, short lead is negative. Custom PCB and a terminal block. And that's what we're, we're going to cover in this step. We're going to finish it in our next step. We're going to attack this thing. So for our terminal block, again, we've got terminal side, plastic side. Terminal side faces out. Solder it into place. 
Uh, flush to the board, make sure that there's a healthy amount of solder, sorry, on the bottom of the board. The two ceramic capacitors go in the C2 slot, labeled C2, 0.1U for 0.1 micro, and C4, for zero, uh, labeled 0.1U, C4. Um, there are several components on here that we are not going to populate. You will still get the schematic as it is, but there are a lot of unnecessary components here or components that could be used for uh, modifications. Uh, in any case, the resistor right here, the 470 ohm resistor goes in the R1 slot right here, and the two electrolytics. First electrolytic, 100 micro, goes in the C1 slot labeled C1, 100, 100U. The little plus sign is above the leftmost lead, so place your long lead in the left slot, short lead in the right slot. Again, don't reverse that, very careful. And for the C3 slot, place your other 100 microfarad ceramic or electrolytic capacitor uh, here. Uh, positive sign is on the lower lead, so long long lead of the capacitor in the, in the lower pin, lower hole rather, and the short lead in the top hole. Just keep looking for that little positive sign, the little plus sign. Very, very easy to solder together. I'm going to solder this into place, and next we're going to do our diode, our um, our header and our LED. Okay, easy step. Just like the diode in the transmitter uh, part portion of the video, this diode has a black side and a side with a white stripe on it. And that's going to go in the D1 slot right here. Now you'll notice from the footprint that there's a stripe on the right hand side of the footprint. Make sure that from a bird's eye view, the white stripe faces the right and that the black side faces the left. So, side with the uh, white stripe, again, is the negative, or cathode, goes in the right hole, black side, positive, anode, goes in the left hole. Solder that into place. And our two-pin header, what we're going to do is we're going to solder that into the LED section right here. The SHT and 5-volt headers we are not going to use for this kit, so make sure that you solder your single two-pin header in the LED slots right here. The LED has a long pin and a short pin, like the capacitors. Now, the LED goes in the LED slot right here, and this is an indicator LED. And so what you want to do is there's a top hole and a bottom hole. The top hole is the negative, bottom hole is the positive. So short lead goes in the top hole, and your long lead goes in the bottom hole. Once you do all that, what we're going to do is we're going to take a two pin uh, header jumper. We're going to short our LED header and then we're going to solder our coil. Hello Mr. Coil, what do you say? The coil, again, no polarity, goes into the C01 or C01 and C02 slots. Solder it in so that it stands straight up. Okay, so we're finally ready to test. Again, thanks for your patience. So I've got the transmitter right beside the receiver. The coils are about uh, half a centimeter to a centimeter apart. They are not f in par completely in parallel right now. We'll play with the uh, transmitter coil in just a second. So I'll power it up. And what's going to happen is the LED on the receiver is going to light up, but uh, the transmitter won't be able to transmit full power up until about 10 seconds after you power it up. And that what that does is that actually heats up the transmitter coil, which changes the inductance and the resistance of the coil uh, to a point where uh, I'm going to be able to pull more power. So it's going to take more than an amp of power when I plug it in and then it's going to settle. It's going to go down, down, down to about 300 milliamps. And when it gets to that point, I'll be able to take, uh, I'll be able to actually pull a bunch of power up to uh, uh, 400 to 500 milliamps when the coils are extremely close to each other. But right now it's not going to take much because the only thing it's loading is an LED. So let's just test it out. Now you see the LED is slowly getting brighter and brighter. That's the coil heating up. So the LED gets brighter as I bring the coils closer together. And as you can see, the LED is blinking because the uh, transmitter coil is going it's going out of range. It's, it's not in parallel. And so when you have them directly in parallel and as close as possible, the more power you can transfer. So at about two centimeters, maybe a little bit less, we're barely seeing the LED light up. Whereas, about a centimeter, LED is really bright. And there you have it. So, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to unplug and I'm going to talk about the booster and the LED bank and then we're going to connect it to the receiver. The booster has four pins on it that are accessible. There's uh, in plus which we would feed our positive voltage to from our receiver, our wireless receiver. In minus, which is our the ground, we would connect to the ground line of the receiver, and our boosted outputs out plus and out mi and out minus. Now I've got that connected to an LED bank, and I've got the booster calibrated to 12 volts. Now what you do is you would hook this up. I've got a switch here, so essentially I'll connect this wire to the uh, V plus output of the receiver, this to the ground of the receiver, and when I turn the switch on, it will apply power to the booster. Now to calibrate the output of the booster, you use this variable resistor. Now this will boost up to 34 volts, but it won't source a whole lot of current at 34 volts. What I want to do is I want to set the voltage to 12 volts, in which case, before I solder it on the LED bank, I would take a multimeter, put my red probe on the out plus line, and my uh, black negative lead from my multimeter to the out minus line. And then what I would do is I would put the transmitter and receiver coils right close together, and I would use this variable resistor and a flathead screwdriver and I would turn it and tune it until the voltage on the multimeter read 12 volts because this is a 12 volt bank. Now you can tune it to 8 volts, it'll still work, it just won't be as bright. Or you can tune it to 12 volts and then when the uh, when the wireless uh, transmitter and receiver coils are close together this will light up. Now again, uh, if you're just powering up, it will require about 10 seconds before the LED bank turns on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook this up and uh, we're going to watch and see what happens once we power it up. So I'm going to plug it all in. I've got my positive going through the switch from the V plus line of the receiver to the in plus line of the booster. I've got, it's already calibrated and I've got my GND, my ground output from my receiver connected to the in plus line. Plug it in. I imagine it'll take about 10 seconds for this to work. Now it's working. It's working faster than it should because the coil is still heated up for my last power up. It would take about 10 seconds, but as you can see, the uh, the LED is still on. The booster, uh, or sorry, the this is it's boosting up to 12 volts, and it flickers depending on the uh, proximity of the two coils and whether or not they're in parallel with each other. So it flickers. I'll bring it back a bit and back a bit further back a bit further and as you can see it starts dimming and going on and off the farther I go away from the two coils so yeah uh, I'll be offering this kit uh, in assembled form in uh, DIY kit form with the booster and LED bank without it you'll have some options uh, it's just basically a fun little science project the schematics for the transmitter and receiver boards will be included uh, and with all versions the 12 volt uh, 2 amp, amp adapter will be included. So basically all you need and uh, relatively easy to put together. Thanks for your patience. I realize the video was a little bit disorganized uh, and I'm very sorry about that. Now when you have the coils completely in parallel within half a centimeter or so the bank is unwavering, the LED bank is unwavering and you're transferring power wirelessly. Now what you'll notice as well is the capacitor, the 0 0.1 microfarad 100, 100 volt capacitor will get a little bit warm and the uh, heat sink will get warm. Not really really hot but warm. So using the schematic if you have a background in electronics you could typically you could potentially use uh, you could use this board to customize your own wireless power set but I'm just selling this as basically a science project, a fun little science project on how to transfer wire uh, power wirelessly between two coils. Thanks for watching, guys.